Hello, everybody. Uh, Karen, I'm hitting the start video, but it says the host has stopped it. Great. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Greetings. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Karen and uh, the Center for Early Childhood uh, Professional Learning uh, for sponsoring me in this third uh, presentation that I've done for uh, you guys. Uh, I really feel honored. And if folks have made it through the either the first two and are back, uh, welcome back for sure. Uh, let's get right started with the PowerPoint. We're going to go through it pretty quickly because I am hoping to allow at least 15 minutes for comments from folks, and we'll talk about that more. In my first year of teaching, I thought guys back in the 60s had to teach upper elementary, and I was teaching sixth grade in an in inner city school in Ohio, and the principal after the orientation began handing out paddles. <laughs> Paddling was a routine form of punishment. I was shocked. I didn't take a paddle, but that was quite an introduction to education. The next year, um, I thought about it a whole lot and I decided I wanted to teach younger kids where I could be the person I wanted to be. And so the next year we taught um, Head Start for the <clears throat> Red Lake Ojibwe in Minnesota. I loved it there. They loved the kids. It was cool. Uh, I taught there for a few years, decided I really liked working with adults from low-income situations to help them become teachers. And so I became a CDA trainer at our local college, got advanced degrees, um, was a professor there for many years. And uh, as a since then, I've written seven books and a column on guidance in early childhood, and um, uh, and I'm pleased to present to you guys today. Uh, my wife, Julie, and I are uh, the parents of five kids, 15 grandkids, and would you believe two great-grandkids. Uh, I have some hobbies. <laughs> we got one of these, Julie. <laughs> uh, 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 let's go on and, and get into things more. One of my hobbies is photography. This is a scene that you might see in northern Minnesota, but not in the winter. And even this one, even though it's a lot warmer here, and I think now in Illinois as well. We both had a touch of real winter a while back, but who knows what's going to happen from here on. Here's some notes. I'm going to let you read through them, and then I'll pick up on a comment or two. We're going to use, instead of um, video clips, which I had varying de degrees of unsuccess with <laughs> in previous presentations, we're going to use six vignettes, which are uh, illustrations of ideas in classrooms. The six vignettes are all come from real anecdotes that former students and colleagues have sent to me. I've modified a few of them uh, for the purposes of the video, uh, but they had real ori origins for sure. And I want to thank right now my wife, uh, Dr. Julie, as we refer to her, Dr. J, who's going to read most of the vignettes for us just for uh, a little bit of a variety in, in the presentation format. There are two key terms that I'm using a little bit differently today. Uh, instead of parents, which is 
what we often use when we talk about the folks responsible for the kids in our program. I'm using the term families. You can read the reason there. And even though um, a few um, teachers of early childhood are working alone, most of us work in a teaching team. And so I'll be using the term TT for instead of teacher in most instances today. And there's a very simple reason that when we work together and work together well, we can accomplish both with kids and parents what individual teachers often have trouble uh, uh, accomplishing on their own. Okay, we're going to turn to our first of 62 or three, whichever is fewer, <laughs> public service announcements to get us started. I'll let you read that through. The goal for us in early childhood programs, um, as many uh, of us old professors and, and other folks in early childhood think, is to build our classrooms, our early childhood settings into encouraging early learning communities. And basically the definition of an early uh, and encouraging early learning community is simple. It's a place where people wanna be both kids and adults when they're sick, as opposed to not wanting to be there when they're well. And to have real um, encouraging early learning communities, uh, we're not just in a world where adults are working with kids. We're working together with families on behalf of the child. And when we can do that, when we can help parents in their task as the primary teachers, we can make a big difference, not only in the child's life, but also in the lives of the family members that we touch in our efforts. And with uh, families and TTs working together, uh, we can build uh, encouraging early learning communities that benefit kids both while they're with us and afterwards. Um, and the reason for the presentation is these three points right here. There are three conundrums, and a conundrum is a, a, um, a sticky, hard to solve problem um, that staff run into when they work with family members in their programs. The first is that the family's interest is primarily on their own child. The TT scope of interest is all children. The second is that families lack trust sometimes in outside socializing, socializing institutions to which their kids go, mainly schools, but also even early childhood programs. And the third uh, conundrum is that staff sometimes lack support and guidance and uh, uh, methods and models for working with parents to build true part, um, partnerships. And that's what we're going to be dealing with here. We're gonna look at all three of these things now and go ahead and um, read that script on the right. While I drink my coffee that does not yet have whiskey in it. That was a joke. The simple illustration there uh, seems like no big deal um, to most families, um, even if we haven't talked with them about how we try and get kids to do as much as they can for themselves. Uh, but for some families, especially uh, if they have mistrust of institutions, if they don't know us well, um, they may um, take a simple thing like not helping a kid get every 
a garment of, of outside gear on, but letting kids uh, do this for themselves. And possibly that might mean that we aren't paying enough attention to their kid and so on. This is why communications with, with uh, family members and starting relationships right away is so important. Go ahead and read that. In some of the vignettes to come, we're going to see uh, a parent who had just a miserable school experience and what it did to him and that made striking up partnerships difficult to do. We're also going to take a look at some uh, differences uh, between staff and, and teachers that can make building partnerships difficult. Um, we'll take a look at those things um, uh, through the readings that Julie's going to give for us. I want to talk about this one in a little bit more detail. You have all received uh, trainings of one kind of another on building partnerships with parents. You're here for the most part today because you want to build partnerships with families. Um, but um, sometimes that uh, gets to be a, a difficult chore. Uh, namely because the skills in working with kids and families are really different. They both take leadership. Leadership with children is way different than leadership with family members. Uh, also, I know, we all know, you are near capacity with your work in the classroom with children. Uh, you've got to summon uh, the capacity to work with, with families. And sometimes that seems like an awful lot, an awful big job to do. Um, at a system level, we do as a society, as a state, um, in counties, in school districts, we need to provide more support for building partnerships with parents because it is so important. Having family members engaged in their children's education makes a big difference to the children and to us and to the encouraging early learning community. And at a program level, you all need adequate information, guidance, and support as well. And that's what this PowerPoint is going to be talking about. I'll let you read the section on the left. Okay, um, that's it. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the session so far. Oh, we're going to not end it here. <laughs> uh, I want to talk with you about what education needs to be for both kids and adults um, if both groups are going to benefit in maximum kind of ways from being in our programs and working with us. The first is the quality and relevance of the information that, that um is being shared uh, between teachers and learning learners. The second dimension is how relevant we can make that information um, to young and old learners in the lives that they're living. The two elements, the two dimensions of content and, and teaching method blend easily in developmentally appropriate practice. It, it's pretty clear if we're using DAP, what the, those two dimensions need to look like. That's not nearly as clear when we're working with families. Um, there isn't the same um, spelling out of models and approaches, and there's not as much education available on working and building partnerships with families. So what we are doing in this presentation is not providing a model, not a tight knit, uh, uh, organizational system that has uh, congruity across all its parts. Rather, uh, we're going to give you guys a, a package of a lot of ideas that you can pick and choose from. Some of them you're probably using already. Um, some you might want to try out to see how they go. We're calling this package, not a model, but a package because it's more informal, a, a family partnerships primer uh, for teaching teams. 
uh, and you can see the letters spelled out there. I will now tell you how this particular acronym is pronounced. It's pronounced which I cannot look in Julie and, and say, or she'll have to wipe off her glasses. <laughs> She's giving me a, a look. <laughs> the package that we're going to be dealing with has three parts. And we'll get to part one right after another public service message. I'll let you read it. especially um, if you can develop partnerships with family members, um, the two dimensions together are gonna bring harmony and they're gonna bring stability and they're gonna reduce stress uh, for the young learners in our programs. Uh, this is why, along with the fact that you can do so much for young learners while their brains are still forming, uh, that you all are in many ways the most important teachers in kids' lives. I don't want to underestimate that or understate it. It's just reality if we take a step back and look at teachers at all different levels of, of an individual's um, growing up. And so the bottom line is just absolutely true, uh, uh, but I can't prove it one way or the other. But you should. Whenever we see a kid's picture, we have a change in topic. This is a, a child's drawing of a garden, a preschooler's drawing of a garden. And it brings us uh, into part one of the package, which is gauging family attendance. I'll let you go ahead and read that. Part one is going to deal with four benchmarks for informally assessing the progress that um, you and families are making in their increasingly um, active engagement in the program. These aren't objectives. They're not rubrics. They're not uh, goals that we hang over uh, families' heads. They're more for us to use uh, in our work with with families so that we have an idea of how they're um, getting along in, with us and in our program and in, in increasing abilities to work with their kids and to um, undergo their own personal and professional development. Parts two and three of um, the package uh, will talk about uh, creating ongoing communication channels with families and communication skills for working with families. Here are the four benchmarks. We'll come back in a little bit and talk about, about why benchmark two is so important in one of our public service announcements. Um, it's important that all families um, have members that progress to level two. Um, some programs, maybe they're a little bit more comprehensive or maybe they're working with especially interested parents um, can help parents reach level three, benchmark three, becoming active in relation to the general program, and even four, progress in personal and or personal development. Rather than lecture more about um, these four um, benchmarks, we're going to start our first um, vignette that Julie's going to read. It's The script is written out as well. 
And this illustrates um, uh, at, uh, parents who have difficulty doing um, conferences and joining uh, with teachers and how a teacher just um, uh, doesn't let that prevent her from figuring out how they can. Donita's mom and dad did not make a welcome conference that Mother Rory had scheduled. Understanding that family life is complicated, teacher Sammy wondered what happened. On Monday, Sammy greeted Rory and Donita with the usual smile and fist bump. Rory spoke quietly with Sammy. She said that on Friday, her husband had a panic attack. She said Joachim had experienced such an awful time in school that he literally retched when he got near a school building. Because it was preschool, Joachim thought he could make it, then couldn't. Sammy asked if it was all right if she thought of something else, and Rory nodded. At pickup, Sammy asked Mom if she thought Dad might join a meeting at a local fast food restaurant. Late that Friday, all four met. While Donita went climbing, Mom, Dad, and Sammy talked at a booth over two diet pit beverages and a regular. Sammy shared examples of Donita's artwork and videos of the child playing with friends. The teacher said more than once how much they enjoyed having Donita in the group. Mom and Dad thought they could encourage Donita to do art activities at home. After this first session, the family and teacher continued the fast food meetings as conferences were a part of the program. Twice, Donita brought in pictures of teacher. Rory and Donita and Sammy had hopes that Dad would make it to the end of the year open house. Thanks, Julia. Here. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, let's talk about this case study, though, in, in terms of the benchmarks. Uh, jumped ahead of ourselves. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, if there were benchmark zero, uh, Joaquin would have been at it. Um, he just had such a miserable school experience himself that he couldn't bear to walk in any kind of school building, even a preschool. Another teacher uh, might not have been able to um, figure out a way to work with um, Rory and Joachim, uh, but um, she did, Sammy did. Sammy saw that the family was trying and she was unrelentingly positive and helping the two reach uh, benchmark two. Why do I think they reached benchmark two? If there had been no um, kind of difference that anyone saw in Donita's reactions as a kid, we might say uh, they were just showing acceptance of the program. But because Donita thought enough of her picture, of her uh, teacher to want to draw a picture, and because the parents were encouraging Donita to draw pictures, especially of their teacher, they were um, for sure uh, progressing to benchmark two in this situation. From zero to two, uh, that's what we want to do. Okay, let's move on. Teacher Ronelda was looking forward to a beginning conference with four-year-old Sharon's mom, Jayla. The TT loved Sharon spunk. Mom and Jayla didn't make it. Neither did Jayla make a greeting meeting the TT held for the new families. Ronelda called Jayla's listed number and Grandma Nita answered. Grandma Nita explained that Jayla had gotten a job as a waitress and worked the 2 to 11 p.m. shift. Grandma said she was caring for Jayla, and Mom often crashed at her place after work. Knowing it would be all right, Nita gave Ronelda's Jayla's cell phone. 
Renelda texted Jayla at work and explained Grandma had given her the cell number. She asked if Jayla could call during the mom's break. Worried, mom did. The two talked, and Renelda got Jayla to ask the manager if they could meet in a booth during Jayla's break. The manager said, sure. Jayla and Renelda hit it off and held regular booth conferences each month. In January, at Renelda's invitation, Jayla came into the classroom before work. Mom ate lunch with Sharon and read a book to her after lunch. Other children joined and Jayla enjoyed the visit. Mom became a regular volunteer. Sharon loved the visits and tolerated the other kids listening to mom read. <laughs> When a former students uh, sent me that anecdote, uh, I was just so pleased and I thanked her very much. Um, and uh, because she didn't give up, you know, uh, some teachers would, but not lead Renelda. And the fact that um, she got Jayla, uh, even, not just to come into class, but to read to the kids really meant that Jayla had progressed to benchmark number three. Now, very often, a common difference between uh, benchmark two and benchmark three is that parents in benchmark three uh, come into the class and they start to volunteer. With so many working parents now, that's more difficult than it was a generation uh, ago. Uh, but if the relationship of the teacher and um, the family member develops enough, uh, family members uh, will make the time and find the time to do that, uh, whether it's over lunch and over a lunch break for the parent at work, um, or um, it's on an occasional class outing. Um, but there are other ways to show that a person as well is interested in uh, in helping out the program beyond their own child. Sitting on committees is, is one. Helping to arrange uh, special events is another. Uh, but what you see in the transition from zero to three uh, that Jayla did here is a parent um, not just uh, showing acceptance of the, of the program, uh, but taking an interest uh, in the learning of their child and helping out in the program altogether. And it was all a result of the bottom line and what our presentation is about. Uh, Renelda was able to build a relationship with mom, Jayla. Before Julie starts on this one, um, this vignette uh, was sent to me in slightly different form by again, a former student who was a kindergarten teacher I modified it a little bit, and we can talk about that in the comment section if you want to. Uh, but the gist of uh, this vignette is really clear and really shows, again, what a, a, a TT member can do by way of building relationship with a family member and the difference it can make. Marta started as a kindergarten teacher in a pre-K third grade school in Minnesota. A veteran teacher told Marta to avoid her student Byron's family as much as possible. Byron was quiet, but took in everything and was a fast learner. Making discreet inquiries, Marta learned from a staff member that the veteran had repeated conflicts with the family over two older children. The family was Amish, but wanted their kids educated in public school. The veteran teacher apparently thought they didn't belong. Marta made a quiet point of reaching out to the family and attempted phone contacts with Mother Cora several times. She left messages, but did not receive callbacks. Undeterred, Marta sent home happy grams with Byron positively acknowledging the child's efforts. A few weeks later, an assistant at the school, 
who was friends with Cora, said she would be willing to meet with Marta in her home. They met. Marta showed definite interest in learning about the family, their faith, and their practices. Marta was able to help Byron's family feel welcome in her classroom community. On occasion, Cora visited as a volunteer. That spring, after Marta talked with the principal and got permission from parents, Byron's family gave rides in two horse and carriage. With Marta's encouragement, Cora wrote and published a picture book, her first, about the experience. Mm -hmm. Well, you saw what that veteran teacher did in that situation was showing discrimination towards Cora and Byron because that teacher didn't believe that that family should be in a public school. Uh, Marta, uh, as a professional and someone who cared about all of the people that she worked with as a first year teacher yet, um, did not go along with what that veteran had to say. She quietly, so as not to offend that veteran, found out about the family, figured out how to um, make contact with the family through being unrelentingly positive and was able to make a fundamental yeah. difference, not only in that family's life, but in the okay. life of the kids at school um, who got an insight into um, a little bit of the life of, of a child that was in their class. Uh, Cora's writing a children's book out of her uh, ability to meet benchmarks one through three really does indicate that she's at benchmark four. I want to pause now and ask if some of you started in early childhood as uh, parents of a young child. And because of your positive relationships with the, with the teaching team members there, um, decided to volunteer, saw that you really enjoyed it, became more active, and maybe even went into the early childhood teaching field uh, as a result of uh, reaching benchmarks one, two, and three. Um, that is a really classic indication of a parent who reaches uh, benchmark four, but it doesn't need, need to be going into the field um, of the classroom that you volunteered in. It doesn't have to be writing a children's book um, it might be that you were active on a committee and volunteered to be treasurer and got interested in bookkeeping and went back to training to be a bookkeeper. It might be that you decided to go back to college after seeing these teachers who might have been college graduates, maybe not, but uh, seeing what they could accomplish towards training and education. Anytime a family member takes that next step in their own professional development, they can say this very important statement. I did it. And because I did it, my kids saw it could be done and they wanted to do it too. I didn't just talk about going back to college. I did it. And now they're on that course. That's the beauty of the situation when family members reach benchmark four, and not only affects their own personal and professional development, but it affects in dramatic ways the aspirations of the children and their families. I'd like to talk a little bit more about why benchmark two is so crucial. Uh, and then we're gonna, uh, do a public service announcement that's not really that, but I'll tell you about it in a minute. Um, when family members reach benchmark two, it means they've established enough trust in the staff that they're working with um, to, uh, to work together with that staff person. And if at this point, uh, a teaching team member uh, or the team as a whole or the lead 
uh, comes across a problem uh, that the child might be having to deal with in the classroom uh, related to emotional behavior, neurological, developmental kinds of factors. Uh, and the staff think that an assessment might be helpful and a remediation plan that's tailored to that child to be helpful. Well, when a, a parent reaches benchmark two, they're going to be much more open to those possibilities uh, because they have developed trust in the staff. They're working together with the staff and together they can benefit the child. If you've ever, uh, <laughs> that's the toddler who lives upstairs. <laughs> uh, if you ever had the experience of trying to suggest to a parent that their child maybe needs extra assistance and they're not hearing it, it means that you have work to do on the relationship from day one, being friendly first, being unrelentingly positive, working with that parent um, to get so that you have a mutual level of understanding and trust established is what you have to do for parents to get to the point where they're going to take, take maybe the very brave, courageous, unprecedented steps in their family, maybe, of getting the assistance that young uh, children might need in their early years so they can have the lasting benefits of, uh, of a comprehensive coordinated remediation plan as they grow. Okay, this picture, by the way, is a picture of Head Start kids riding on the bus to Head Start. <laughs> I'll let you think about it while we take a little bit of, we'll call this one an intermission. Uh, I'm uh, running this PowerPoint today so that we'll be done with lots of uh, time for discussion. But we need you to help with this. And so this is what I'm going to ask you to do. In terms of uh, part one of the package, uh, having to do with the benchmarks, in terms of the introduction to the package where we kind of went through obstacles that, um, that can block and make difficult uh, parent family member, or uh, excuse me, family member teaching team partnerships. In parts two and three of the package that we're going to deal with now, what I would like to ask you to do is to pick out a point or two as we go, uh, either from the preceding material or the new period material. Decide whether um, that idea that you've selected is a takeaway idea an idea that you'd like me to comment more on or a question uh, that you'd like me to respond to. The comment can be um, a reality check comment. It doesn't matter. But what I'm going to ask you to do when we get all done is to note whether you're going to share a TA idea, takeaway idea, a C idea, comment idea, um, or um, a Q idea, question idea. I'd like for you, when we have our chat, to indicate which it is, T, A, C, or Q. And if you can, indicate the slide that it came from, that your uh, idea came from, that you'd like me to talk a little bit more, or thank you very much for coming up with. Um, and we'll take 162 of those comments <laughs> or else as many as we can fit in in the time that we have left just to make this session not just one way, uh, but interactive. Okay, have you got that? I can repeat it, but no, I don't need to. Um, this bus by now has gotten all the way to Head Start. So let's go on to part two building communication channels. And I'm gonna cover this just because it's an overview slide. From day one, um, the, the teaching team follows that mantra of being family friendly first. They know if the child is happy in the programs, 
family members will be more likely to build partnerships. Um, the vice, the opposite is true as well. Um, if kids see that their uh, family members are enjoying working with the teaching team member, that's going to make life better uh, for the kids as well. Both um, directions um, that uh, be friendly first, unrelentingly positive uh, aspect works. Uh, there are lots of ways uh, to build relationships um, that are reciprocal, that have trust as a basis of them. And we're going to talk about um, five communication channels uh, for doing just that. Uh, a really important part of this starts with when parents drop off their kids and pick them up if that's happening in your particular program. Um, uh, brief daily updates of parents rather than just high and and not spending a few minutes with them is really important. I know staff are really busy and this is a really busy part of the day, but the more individual contact you can give at drop off and pick up time, uh, the more that family members will know that you can care about their kid. Um, there are going to be ideas in this part, too, that you're probably already doing. Consider them reinforcement and cheering you on. There are others that you might want to try. I'm going to run through these fairly quickly, again, because they're fairly well spelled out, and you have them in your edition of the PowerPoint. Um, and there aren't any vignettes here. I want to get us to more vignettes because they're the most fun. Welcome conferences. I'll let you read that. The purpose of welcome conferences, whether um, the situation is fortunate enough so that you can do them in the family's home or in a neutral uh, situation like a fast food restaurant uh, or in the classroom. Uh, I know one classroom teacher that I worked with a lot had a little tiny parent's nook set up with a coat hanger, um, an easy chair, not a big one, um, and a uh, and a table and the family members when they arrived could go in that area hang up their coat leave their stuff and then work in with the kids in the classroom um this uh a parent nook family nook was um not even much bigger than a closet but it was the parent space and when a parent asked the teacher if they could meet in that space for their conference the uh, the teacher knew that it was a good idea that she had set it up. She had it set off with just um, cardboard uh, dividers that she had made herself. Again, it was not big. But wherever you have the conference, there are a couple things to remember. It's not a conference to grill a family about the child or their heritage or um, their beliefs or anything like that. It's... Um, to let the family members know that you enjoy having their kids in the group. Uh, if you have samples of their artwork, um, that worked very well. Uh, in uh, one of the anecdotes that we just saw, uh, videos on uh, on a, what do you call those little things, Julie? On a phone or a tablet that you can share, <laughs> that you can share uh, with the family member right there. So that the family members know that you care enough about their kids um, to have individual uh, impressions of what they're doing and individual samples of their work. Uh, welcome conferences, I think, are just really important to have. Again, unfortunately, in some programs, you have to do them on your own time. I know that. Um, I wish it weren't the case. We need more resources, but it's important that they be done.
The second channel uh, of communication to open with families are greeting meetings. You might hold these at a couple of times if you're starting a new program year uh, in the afternoon and evening so you can accommodate family schedule. Uh, if you have families joining kind of at random during the year, you might do one a month and talk with the parents about when you can have it. Uh, the purpose of greeting meetings is for family members to get to know each other and to begin forming the community uh, uh, outside the community um, so that uh, family members and kids uh, can have uh, a place in this world that they know they all belong. Uh, the greeting meetings might feature small groups if you have a large group so parents can get to know a couple of other parents um, and maybe a staff person or two. Um, greeting meetings allow for folks to get acquainted. That's the first purpose. The second are for you to let the families know concisely about the program that we're that they're joining. A lot of times, uh, uh, unless there is uh, an effort to let parents know uh, policies uh, and guidelines, um, they don't have a clear idea of what the program is about. And there are a lot of issues that might come up that um, because you haven't talked about them formally in a greeting meeting and maybe included them in a handbook, which we'll talk about next, uh, parents might not be aware that you have a consistent policy on. So greeting meetings um, that help people get acquainted and uh, introduce them to the guidelines and policies of the program are really important when they start up. And that remember is underlined for a reason. Um, be sure you stay within preset times because everybody's busy and um, people in uh, distance classes like this one, no less than family members at a greeting meeting, appreciate if the folks in charge end the event on time. Communication channel three, welcome to our program guidebook. I'll let you read that and then we'll talk about it a little bit. A couple of comments. Um, the first is it's great if staff can have input into annual or new editions of the guidebook. Um, if staff can have input and it's not just something done by administrators, they will be more apt to buy into it. And um, by virtue of their being able to buy into it, they can help new staff who also you would give the guidebook to to learn about the program and expectations and that kind of thing. The second comment does is um, maybe 10 years ago, we might have talked about an optional um, item like developmentally appropriate touch, but now we've got issues of gender identity that have become politicized. And so it's important, I think, to have some hot topic items um, mentioned in your guidebook uh, about um, items like friendly appropriate touch and gender identity. Would you believe that a staff told me that she once worked in a, in a program that had some male as well as female teachers and the t policy of the director actually was that women could put kids on their laps and hold them, but men were not to touch the children. Holy tamole, that's almost 19th century. Um, and the that staff member or that former student didn't stay long in that program. Um, but little kids need touch. They need friendly touch. And in these days, they need appropriate friendly touch. And having that policy worked out among staff and directors and including it in a handbook 
uh, I think is an important thing to do. This one maybe goes without saying. I'll let you read it, and I'll just talk a little bit about happy grams. Okay, um, on the second dot, uh, don't assume all families want or have electronic access. Um, there is a phenomenon out there called electronics uh, privilege uh, favoritism. And basically it comes down to uh, TT members talking more with parents um, who have access to electronic medium, uh, media because it's so comfortable um, for folks of uh, who are not antiques like me um, uh, to use. But there may be some families that for philosophical reasons or just uh, economic reasons choose not to do electronic media. And we need to reach those families just as much, if not more, than the other families in our program. Um, so where do you find out what the preferences are? You do that in the opening conference. Um, you find out, you ask, what are your preferences for getting messages from school? And you, of course, respect the, what the uh, family members have to say. The second one is happy grams. These are compliments of a child's efforts and achievements, especially if uh, you and a, a family member have talked about something that a kid is especially working on. They're important. But even before that, right in the couple of weeks, um, every child in your program should be receiving happy grams. In infant toddler programs, uh, something like happy grams are required in many states. You have to give a record of the child's intake and outtake and and maybe other kinds of things. The happy gram can pick up on that and just uh, write a personal comment to the family member about the infant, toddler, preschooler, or even kindergarten kid in, in their uh, group. Remember, some of your parents will only have uh, had their families receive negative notes from schools over time or else just uh, 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 announcements of events coming up. Uh, a personal positive comment home is you being friendly first. It's you working on uh, that relationship right from day one. Uh, and they're really important. They can be electronic. They don't have to be written notes. What you work out with the family by way of ongoing communication is what's important here. Okay, in-person conferences to resolve problems. Go ahead and read it. Okay, before we get to the um, public service announcement, uh, we're going to see an in-person conference to resolve a problem uh, in a vignette that's coming up, and you'll see some of these uh, points reinforced. Uh, but I just want to reiterate that if a kid is having problems, that's not a thing to send notes home, electronic or hard copy. That's not even a thing to try and talk in a three minute text phone, uh, text or a, a short uh, phone conversation, you maybe wanna set up a meeting with, with a cell phone 
but the meetings need to be in person. If a child is having a serious problem, you all need to work together in a face-to-face -face manner. That's absolutely important. Oh, geez, there's another public service announcement. Go ahead and read it. Okay, a couple of quick comments here, and then we'll see um, uh, some of these ideas uh, illustrated. Uh, the first is, uh, the more serious the problem a kid is having in the classroom, the more not just the teaching team, but teaching team and administrators need to work together. Uh, I know that if you're teaching staff, you don't have a lot to say about that but you can initiate contacts with administrators using your uh, social smarts, because if they're involved too, then the problem is much less likely to just fall back on you. So there's a survival aspect um, of working together with administrators uh, right, right from the beginning, just as you're building relationships with family members, with administrators as well, so that when something comes up, you can work together. Uh, the last comment, I have a website uh, which is listed there, uh, and one of the handouts on the website is something called an individual guidance plan. The individual guidance plan uh, has to do uh, with when kids specifically have behavioral, social, emotional difficulties and a comprehensive solution formula for working in that situation but really the individual guidance plan works for any kind of serious situation that you need to talk with administrators and family members about. And it's free for the downloading. Uh, many of the handouts that I have from this uh, session and others as well, uh, all you have to do is go on the website and click and you've got them at your disposal. I do request that if you sell them for more than five bucks a piece, you pay a royalty of 25 cents to meet no We'll stop there. <laughs> okay, we're up to part, um, what are we up to? Part three, communication skills um, of the, um, the, the package. I do want to caution you with this one picture. This was the picture a child made of their family. And the teacher found out the hard way that the blue and purple figure um, uh, there was not the kid's baby brother, as the teacher um, assumed, it was their pet dog. I mean, kids have their priorities. <laughs> Go ahead and read that. In the two books that I list at the end of the PowerPoint, I have sections on each one of those communication uh, uh, practices. Some of them seem so simple that you might wonder why I mentioned them, like smiling and nodding, uh, but they make a whole of difference when you uh, realize you're using them and more, perhaps more intentionally use them. We'll talk about um, each one of the eight uh, via the vignettes that follow. The first vignette uh, deals with uh, communication practices one through four. The second one where things get really serious. It takes us uh, three slides to, to uh, uh, describe that vignette. Uh, things get really serious. And so we'll talk there about five through seven. And then the last one that we're going to end the presentation on uh, is number eight, remembering names, conversations, and promises. Okay, we're going to go on to the, uh, the vignette that talks to one through four.
In her second week, just for Sylvia, runs up to teacher Amy on the playground. Me gots new sneakers, teacher. Shows Amy her multicolored, lights up, blinking sneakers. Amy, smiling, nodding, and pausing, acknowledges, I bet you can run fast in those tenny runners. Sylvia, not tenny runners, sneakers. Watch me, teacher. And runs a quick lap around the playground. Amy watches and gives the child a big thumbs up. That day at pickup, Amy greets Dad Devon with a big grin. Devon, Sylvia showed me how fast she can run in her new sneakers. Pauses. Devon, yeah, she doesn't even want to take them off when she goes to bed. Teacher smiling. She's quite a kid. With a grin, Papa continues. She sure likes school. She wants to go even if she's not feeling good. Amy, nodding and smiling, I'll be sure to let the team know we have a happy, fast-running camper. Amy and Dad exchange, have a good day. Devin is just the kind of parent that makes us smile sometimes. Okay, let's look at this. Um, which of those um, one through four uh, did, did uh, Amy use? All four of them. Uh, she used acknowledge and pause several times. Acknowledge and pause is just, in my view, the fundamental communication technique to use with other folks, um, just to acknowledge what they're doing and to interrelate with them in a positive kind of way about what they're doing. You acknowledge a detail. Um, uh, you can really run fast in those tiny ru runners. You've covered that blue piece of paper completely with white chalk. You say in your words what you see that what a kid is doing, and then you pause. And almost always, you'll get um, a response uh, that is inclusive of the two of you in the experience, which is a bonding kind of thing. Um, and that's really important to do. Amy used the acknowledge and pause with uh, Pop, Devon, as well as the child. Very often, acknowledge and pause just flows into contact talks. That happens when, after your pause, the other person picks up on the A and P and continues the conversation. Uh, Devon uh, made that uh, comment when he talked about uh, uh, how much she likes school. Contact talks are the absolute platinum technique for building relationships with others. Uh, acknowledge and pause. If the other person picks up on it, you just continue the conversation. And uh, that makes the conversation a relationship building quality time communication uh, that really means something in the long run for uh, building trust uh, between you and another person. Can't overestimate contact talks, especially and even with kids. Smiling and nodding, uh, what more can I say? Uh, but then we know we're using this practice enough when our heads are tired and our lips are sore. <laughs> Not, smiling and nodding should just be the stock nonverbal uh, reactions that we have when we're working with others and encouraging early learning communities. Uh, smiling and uh, friendly comments that Amy used throughout the conversation meant that she was using friendly humor throughout. And when we co consistently use friendly humor with other folks, uh, we not only make life lighter for everybody, but we maybe pass along a great gift. Uh, if you use friendly humor with your own kids a lot, they're more likely to use friendly humor when they uh, grow up. And that's a key idea. And the word friendly there is, of course, really important. We know the other kind, sarcastic humor, that's not really humorous. This is the friendly time kind that, um, that includes everybody. Okay, now we have the magnum opus, the big problem situation that was not solved successfully for every parent 
uh, just because it was such a difficult problem. This is an, indeed a conundrum of um, that um, preschool teachers might not want to have to deal with, but you very well might at some point in your career. Thomas's mom, Claire, was friends with Martin's mother, Artis, from before their two kids joined the preschool program. Together, they attended the greeting meeting and received the welcome booklets. At the TT's invitation, the two parents observed the class. The one mom, Artis, was disturbed to see 50-month-old Cedric dressing in cut-off women's clothes during choice time. Artis returned twice more and saw the same thing. Artis complained to director Bernice and said she wanted a meeting of Bernice and the TT. Bernice agreed to a meeting the following week. Bernice talked at length with the TT, lead Sage, Kayla, and Aisha. She visited the classroom twice. Sage knew Cedric's family and made a home visit. Mom was fine with Cedric's dress up. Artis brought her friend Claire to the conference. Leading the meeting, Director Bernice said she appreciated the interest the moms were showing and that they saw they could come to the staff to talk about concerns. Bernice stated that confidentiality guidelines meant that no other children's names would be used. Bernice asked Artis to share. Artis said the program was encouraging one child to be gay, and it was inappropriate for the other children to see that. Artis continued that the TT needed to stop that boy's unnatural behavior. After Artis was done, Bernie asked Claire to share, but Claire declined. The director then pointed out language in the guidebook about gender identity, saying it's normal for young children to be learning by experience about both male and female gender roles. She asked whether anyone had noticed concerns in other children about the one child's pattern. Claire said no. Artists didn't answer. Sage said if they had, the TT would have responded. Bernice asked how they could solve the problem together. Artis said, stop the child's behavior or she would pull her child. When asked, Claire said it wasn't that big of a deal to her. Everyone looked at Bernice. After pausing, Bernice said to Artis that they all really enjoyed having Martin in the group. She mentioned that both children and staff would miss him if he left. Bernice continued that since the child's pattern was allowed for in the guidebook, the child, like everyone, could dress up the way they wanted during choice time. Bernice concluded by saying maybe artists could think it over the weekend and she and Bernice could talk more. She said Artis and Martin would always be welcome to attend their program. Artis gave a slight nod. The meeting ended. As they left, Artis was talking lividly with her friend Claire. On Monday, both Artis and Martin were absent. Claire arrived with Claire arrived with Thomas. Claire told Sage she caught it for not backing Artis more at the meeting. Claire said that Artis told her she would be looking for a new program. Claire told Sage she didn't feel the same way, but felt she needed to be at the meeting for her friend. Sage said she respected Claire for being a friend and knew that the meeting must have been hard. Sage paused. Claire said, we're staying. Tom, Thomas likes it here and so do I. Compliment sandwiches describe, express, direct, and reconciling. You can read that.
by the duck construct, I don't mean that this incident was like uh, water off a duck's back. Uh, I mean the other duck construct of a duck swimming in a lake. Uh, the upper part of the duck out of the water looks like it's uh, just uh, going along as usual with nothing special happening. But underneath the legs of the duck are churning and churning and churning to make the duck go. Sometimes we just have to try our best, try and keep our um, cool about us, work together. And wherever that flow of the river takes everybody, it takes everybody. In this case, um, it took Artis um, and her boy um, in a different direction. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, Claire and, and her son stayed in the program. When we try our best to be unrelentingly positive, even when conflicts like this happen, uh, the parent may still get on social meeting, uh, media and lambast our program but they're likely to be less virulent about it. And even if they are, the staff can uh, should know that they work together closely as a team and they did what their um, program's core mission and values uh, were all about. This is the last vignette in the presentation. I'm going to read this one and it has to do with uh, communication uh, practice eight, remembering names, conversations, and promises. We're going back to the sneakers. And I need to move this over here a little bit. I can't. I, can't. Right. I have my glasses on, so we're good there. Two weeks later, a drop-off. Amy said hola to Dave, Devon and Sylvia. Kidding Sylvia, Amy says, I see you still have on those speedy tennis, tennis runners. I mean sneakers. <laughs> Sylvia gives her teacher a smiley frown. Chuckling, Devon says, she was worried when she got dirt on them, but they came out of the washer clean and we put them uh, by the heater to dry. Smiling, Amy says, tell me about that later, okay, Sylvia? The kid nods. Devon continues, and this was a pause that allowed uh, Devon to decide whether to continue the talk, and he did. Yeah, we had to get the same sneakers for her sisters, too. We turned off the lights and they danced around. It was a cool time. Later, Amy gets Sylvia to share about cleaning the dirty sneakers, not tenny runners, and probably also dancing in her sneakers. I don't think we need to do the analysis on those, but you can see we're remembering names, conversations, and promises is a big part of the friendly communication that we need to build partnerships with uh, parents. Okay, um, the names of a couple of handouts that I think are really useful in relation to um, this presentation are listed there. Moving to an encouraging classroom, uh, and individual guidance talks. And again, there at my PowerPoint address, dangartrell.net. There are also the two book references there, a guidance guide for early childhood leaders and ed for civil society. Um, those two books really serve as the reference sources for this presentation. Okay, now remember, this is what you're going to do. You are going to note something new or reinforced for you through the session. It's either going to be a takeaway idea, a comment, or a question. You're going to write it down and submit it for the chat. And if you can, remember a slide number, put that on there too, so that we know what um, slides um, your ideas came from. That one's not required, though. That's an optional one. Okay. Uh, let's go for it. And so I'm going to the chat, opening up the chat. <laughs> hey, I'm reading them just like you. Other messages?
Cool. We scroll up, there's a question from Christine. Okay. Okay, and Christine's question. Uh, question benchmarks. Can you go more in detail about benchmarks? For example, ways or lists of ways families can meet benchmarks. For more details about establishing them and our parents involved in establishing them in the welcoming visit. Cool. Okay. Um, the benchmarks, uh, as I write about, weren't originally called benchmarks. They were called levels. And I write about the benchmarks in almost all of my books. Uh, and uh, the books provide a fairly thorough uh, account of what that particular level of engagement looks like and how to help uh, family members reach that level. Um, in In working on the most critical change from level one, assuming parents uh, have attended the beginning of the year uh, activities and think it's important um, to, um, uh, to uh, work with their child in the program, that those folks, it doesn't take much to help them progress to level two. Who it might take more effort with is parents that are different in appearance or language or culture than you, the teaching team member. And uh, that's where those beginning of the year um, initiatives that you take to show families that you're on the same side as they are, you're working together on behalf of the child, and how much especially you enjoy working with that child uh, where that particular um, approach is, is really important to instill. And with some parents, either for uh, emotional, social, cultural, linguistic reasons, it's going to take lots of active work on your part to help them get from level one to level two. But again, that's the most important shift that uh, family members need to make and uh, teachers need to use all their smarts and their resources um, to help parents um, reach the guideline. Uh, we went from levels to guidelines because levels like uh, four goals for working with parents would be another way of saying it. Um, those uh, That vocabulary indicates that teacher team members may be working specifically with families uh, on those goals um, to the extent that they may be um, pressure those families in a particular direction and feel particularly uh, like failures if parents don't reach that next goal or level. With, um, got, with uh, benchmarks, uh, we can see that these are things that some parents will reach and some parents won't. And as long as we try their best, it's not anything that, that we can teach to in a direct kind of way or try and, and uh, level training towards. It always comes back to our positive relations with those parents and our encouragement of them to progress. So those are the reasons that in my latest book, different from even the two red leaf books that I wrote in 2017 and 2020 um, that uh, we've switched from levels to benchmarks. My editor wanted me to take that change and I'm just uh, was happy to do it as I thought about it more. Okay, Carol has a question. Hi, Carol. On the communication channels, how do you reconcile members of the same team when they have disagreement on their understanding of these channels. For instance, one team member wants to use number five and number four for uh, behavioral issues. Um, well, <laughs> it goes back to day one uh, that uh, that 
basically any team is going to have um, uh, differences of view and possibly even conflicts, which are expressed disagreements. Um, from day one, the team leader, and there almost always is a team leader in programs, needs to work to build team spirit in that team, to build inclusiveness, to build mutual respect, uh, to build um, honest friendliness, to use friendly humor, um, to take an interest in each other's uh, families and communities. Basically, leads need to be friendly first with the staff members on their team. If they, if they do everything they can, then a, a lot of differences um, they can either resolve or like in a marriage, one person agrees it's not so important as to uh, break the windows and, and yell and scream. They go along with it, but that doesn't mean they keep don't keep working with that team member, A, on that relationship and B, very gently to have them see um, the uh, the relationship in a way where they can work out difficulties not a magic answer that's an entirely different powerpoint and and maybe from a different person but th i guess that's the best i can do we have quite a few comments and takeaways but there's one more question slash comment great liked the ideas about meeting parents where they are comfortable and when they have time around slide 25 but I wonder how that works in today's society with boundaries and being appropriate, always being pushed. Thoughts on this? Um, you know, if you look at the, the programs that really are successful in helping um, uh, parents get, move along on the landmark, on the, on the benchmark scale, those programs are likely to have a fairly cohesive staff. Um, there's cooperation between administrators and teachers when things get tough. Um, and people just um, are really comfortable being in that community. I, and it's really important for folks to try and do their best to work towards those communities within the the confines and limitations of the roles that they have in the program. Uh, and very often, um, if, if leads especially can um, develop relationships with, with for instance, directors, um, they can uh, work through some uh, moves that might be a little bit different uh, than the traditional uh, because the director will listen to the teacher's reason. Uh, and what I mean are the two conferences, the three conferences that that uh, happened outside of the classroom. Uh, in all three of those cases, um, uh, the teachers and the, and the directors agreed that to get parents from zero to one, they had to do um, something uh, special and something out of the ordinary. And when you have directors backing staff, uh, that can make a big difference um, with the boundaries that we usually have today. In other words, um, you wouldn't just make uh, a home visit to a parent like Cora, um, who's of a particular faith and obviously has very strong individual strength, without talking with the director first and, and going over the pros and cons and deciding together that that's what needed to happen. In the, uh, in the vignette with the child who was dressing in women's clothes, before they even had that meaning, uh, Sage, the teacher, um, went on a home visit and met with uh, Cedric's um, mom just to see where the family was coming from on that, to have that background, and then took that back to the director and the teaching team. Communication within the staff is just so important when things do get uh, a little bit out of the box.
I was eyeballing a lot of ideas that folks like there. Okay, let's read this one. Uh, it's a comment. For those interested in happy grams, my son's teacher did something similar last year. She had a very simple half sheet that said, I'm proud of. She filled in the kid's name uh, for whatever the kid did. She filled out why. It was great. My son often opted for these rather than a tangible reward. I recently uh, pushed this last year where I was at but I haven't done that so much this year. So glad I've got this reminder. Yeah, we're so stereotyped that the messages going home are either just information or not necessarily positive, that those positive hard copy notes um, tell a parent, gee, a, a, a teaching team member felt strongly about it, then they actually didn't just text or email, they wrote it out. And they can have make a lasting difference. So I thank the person, uh, Rebecca, for that comment. Okay. Uh, oh, on the compliment sandwiches, uh, one uh, quick comment. The more often that you can do triple deckers, the better. Uh, and what I say in the presentation is what you try and do is build really good bread about the liver and kale uh, message that you may need to cover in the compliment sandwich. Uh, I think the research shows a ratio of three to one or even four to one uh, in early childhood is more effective than a two to one, uh, but you do what you can with, with uh, the situation you're in. Uh, I like this comment as well. Remembering is so important. Using a sibling's name or remembering little details of a conversation makes a difference in how families relate to you. That's also true for kids uh, in your program. Uh, I have a problem remembering names that hasn't gotten any easier as I've gotten older. And some teachers who have trouble uh, or administrators who have trouble remembering names use tricks to help them do that uh name tags or uh uh you know even though they're a little blatant uh still um the other person uh said, doesn't think primarily oh you remembered me only because it's a name tag they may think that momentarily but then when you go on and talk with that person uh name tags uh, don't have the same kind of onerous meaning that they do otherwise so if you need to use a trick to use it because that remembering is so important oh somebody liked the individual guidance plan cool it's free um you know thank you very much for this training but i'm gonna have to go back in the classroom soon okay well i, I think it's scheduled to end uh at five is that right karen i'm